from findmypathway.com. Uh, welcome to the first of our series of interviews with uh, industry leaders and professionals. Today I'm here with Sir Gustav Nossel. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having us. It's an absolute honour to be here. It will be fun to participate. <laughs> Um, so, Professor Nussel, I want to give a bit of background about you first. Um, you've had an absolutely fascinating life. You've been recognised with almost every honour and award a scientist can be recognised with. Uh, for example, the Albert Einstein World Award of Science. Um, you've been named Australian of the Year. You were even knighted by the Queen for your research into immunology. Um, and you've been heading world-leading research institutes, such as the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, um, you've worked with some incredible people and organisations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and most recently you've even had a high school and uh, I believe a research institute named after you um, and you've been recognised with Lifetime Achievement Awards from Monash University. So all in all, pretty amazing stuff. Um, I think the first thing that I'm really interested in, in asking you about is you've had all these in amazing opportunities and all these different potentials for career pathways. How did you decide the direction of your career since you graduated? Well, first of all, Alan, thank you for the quite generous <laughs> and altogether excessive pluck. You know. <laughs> first of all, you don't want to believe everything you hear and read. And secondly, uh, if there's a pretty good curriculum vitae there, it's mainly because I've been very lucky in life. So let the uh, viewers and listeners put a good discount factor behind everything you said. <laughs> now, uh, let's get on to the question of my career. Funnily enough, uh, I've wanted to do medicine and become a doctor as long as I can remember, from probably about the age of seven. Wow. Uh, would you believe I was 16 years old? all of 16 years old when I entered medical school in 1948. 16, wow, that's amazing. Well, I can tell you, uh, because of that, uh, I really wasted the first two years and um, didn't kind of wake up until third year mid. And, and so you, you started at a very early age, 16, to do medicine, um, but you ended up not as a clinical professional, but rather as a research professional. Yes, well, I can tell you a story about that. Um, as of, at the beginning, uh, you know, I thought I would do medicine and I got to know a bit more about what, well, yeah, I'll end up as either cardiologist or neurologist. I never was going to be a surgeon, I was going to be a physician specialising in some interesting fields. Now, two things really happened uh, in that third year that made a difference. First of all, we had enormous classes. We were 600 in first year. Well, quite a few failed that first year early. We had very bad uh, staff student ratios. And to be absolutely frank, we were pretty badly taught. So in that third year, a few of us so-called clever kids got together and said, look, we're going to teach one another. Oh, well. We'll study up a particular branch of physiology or a particular branch of um, biochemistry. And then we'll give little seminars to one another, sort of self-help teaching. And that got me into the research literature, which I found absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. So that was point number one. Point number two, my uh, elder brother Peter uh, turned to academia. He became a biochemist and a senior lecturer in biochemistry at the University of Adelaide. So I think a little bit of hero worship for my brother also <laughs> helped. I think they were the two factors that yeah. made me branch out into research. That's, that's really interesting. Um, you mentioned that your brother is, was, I, I guess, a, um, a, a mentor and someone who you looked up to. Did you also have any other role models and mentors? Ah, well, that's a very wonderful question and I has a very direct answer. <laughs> I'm unbelievably lucky to have had two quite outstanding mentors. The first one was Sir McFarlane Burnett. He was the director of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, arguably Australia's greatest biologist ever. And it was because of him and wanting to work under him mm -hmm. that I moved from Sydney to Melbourne. I'd been a resident at uh, Prince Alfred Hospital, very happy there. 
actually got married in Sydney, but uh, moved to Melbourne in 1957 as a young 26-year-old man, particularly to work with Burnett. And he was a fantastic mentor, but I'll qualify that in, in a moment, mm -hmm. and when I tell you about the second one. The second one was my mentor for the postdoctoral period in the United States at Stanford University for oh. two and a half years, from 61 to, uh, sorry, from 59 to 61. And his name was Joshua Lederberg, and would you believe he also was a Nobel laureate. <laughs> now, the two were very different. Burnett was quiet, contemplative, stern, aloof, inner. He was not much good in a robust discussion. He had to take the problem away, study it in the quiet of his own study at night, come back two or three days later with suggestions and an answer. But wise and deep. Now the second chap, Josh Ehrberg, he was a real slow coach. He actually took until age 33 to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> he was the second youngest Nobel Prize winner in medicine ever. Second only to Jim Watson of Watson and Crick fame, wow. who was 32. So Josh was lightning fast. He loved a robust debate, an argument, if you will. You would try and expound some kind of a scientific idea, and he would say, Yes, yes, go on. I've, I've got that point. Go on, make your next point. <laughs> you know, it was just a completely different um, uh, thing. And he was also an extraordinary polymath. Apart from his work in genetics, he was a geneticist. And I worked in his department of genetics at Stanford University. He was also very interested in what he called exobiology. It was actually a field which he started which was what would you do about searching for life in outer space, wow. on the moon and, and, and the planets and that sort of thing. He actually devised instrumentation that went to the moon. Really? To try and gather uh, particles and bring them back and see if they had life. Um, his That's other fun. great passion, look at this one, and I'm now talking about the 1950s, computers in medicine. He was really the first one to yes, say I mean, yeah. there's going to be an immense potential here. And he wrote some of the early programs, for example, searching for drugs via images in the computer. So he was the second one. And both of those people took me under their wings sequentially. And I had the hugest respect for each of them. And they were so different. Yeah, it sounds like that. I mean, I'd, I'd be really interested in also knowing how did they affect your career pathway as well, mentors? Or well, as each of them, uh, uh, to this degree, took me under their wings in that they uh, promoted my career. Uh, Burnett facilitated my move to Lederberg's laboratory. Lederberg, interestingly enough, uh, actually made me an assistant professor. He said, look, it's going to look better on your curriculum vitae than just postdoctoral fellow. And after my planned time there had expired, uh, he actually said, look, I'd like you to stay at least another five years and become an associate professor, uh, which was the next rung up mm. in the career ladder. And I said, no, look, I've really got my heart set on going back to Australia for family reasons. And also I could see Burnett's retirement not so far off <laughs> and maybe having it tilted of being director of the Hall Institute myself. Yeah. So each of them furthered my career in their own way. Yeah, that's that sounds incredible. Um, I'd like to ask you also, just switch gears a little bit. Um, in your early career, just after graduating, I'm sure you made quite a few <laughs> mistakes, as we all do. Um, would you be able to speak about some of the failures that you've had since then, or in your life since then, and um, what have you learned from that? Um, what I have, where I have failed, I think, is I'm not a very creative person. I'm very good at analysis. I've got tons of drive. Stick with it. Let's go and follow your goal to the absolute end. But of course, to be a great scientist, you've also got to have a ton of imagination. And to be frank, I haven't got that. Mm -hmm. And so, 
if you could give one piece of advice to your younger self, what, what would it be? Would it be something to do with imagination or trying to be more no, creative? What, or is it? The advice that I would give my younger self is try harder to learn than to shine. It was always my insane ambition, you know, to be brilliant, to excel. <laughs> now, if I quietened down a bit and said, I've got this opportunity now to learn, I'm going to learn, I'm going to put to shine to one side. There is a difference. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, so I think um, based on everything that we've, we've spoken about, um, I think it would be really interesting for people listening at home and students who are currently experiencing, you know, not knowing what to do, you know, graduating students or people who don't know what to do with their career pathway. If you could um, shed a little bit of uh, your own opinion or advice on how would someone know if they're on the right pathway or if they need to change a pathway, what, what would your advice be? Well, students? of course, one simplistic and obvious answer, not the one you're looking for, is <laughs> if you're on the right pathway, your grades and your achievements in exams and so forth will show it. I think more important than that is whether you are being true to yourself in terms of the goal setting and the pathway forward. You set out to do something, you say to yourself, I want to do this and that. I want to become a surgeon, you know. And to do that, I've got to do medicine, mm -hmm. and then afterwards I've got to do a residency, and after that I've got to be a surgical assistant, so forth. Are you, in fact, being true to the path that you've set yourself? If you've set yourself a path to be a good carpenter, or to be a plumber, or whatever it is, am I, in fact, on that track? Or have I allowed myself to be diverted? Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to be true to yourself and to stick on the track that you've set yourself. Yeah, no, I 100% I agree. Uh, would you say that's one of the most important things that people can get out of studies and work? Or is there other very key factors that people should be trying well, to... Well, of course, out of studies and work, uh, the first and most important thing is to develop a skill set. Uh, I've mentioned being a surgeon, I've mentioned being a carpenter, you know. Yeah, of course. To be a surgeon, you've got to be dexterous, you've got to know where to cut, you've got to know when to cut and so forth. And so it's very important to develop a skill set. But also, uh, it's very important to dream a little bit and possibly dream, you know, they say a person's uh, reach should exceed their grasp. Yeah. Dream a little bit more, dream a little bit further, try to be the very best person that you can in your chosen field. Yeah, I, th I think that's absolutely 100% uh, amazing advice. Um, would there be any other tips that you can offer specifically for students who are trying to start their journey in the world of research or science, you know, coming into it? It's probably a very different Yes, there have been two things There'd be two things that I'd say to a young person who's contemplating a career in research. The first is think big. Choose some goal that is meaningful. Don't bother about being the one to cross the T's or dot the I's or fill in some tiny little detail mm. about uh, uh, multiple sclerosis or uh, a cut on your leg or so forth. Think big, uh, espouse big and ambitious goals. You won't reach them, yeah. but if you don't aim high, uh, you certainly will not get to a high point in your research. The second thing is, and it's very interesting how little students think about this, mm. be very careful about the choice of a mentor. Mm. If in point of fact you just uh, listen to the person who's your lecturer in physiology, Say, oh, that lecture on hematology sounded pretty interesting. I'll go and do my Bachelor of Medical Science with that woman. Or I'll go and do uh, a master's degree, take a couple of years off and do a master's degree in that. Now, if you haven't done your research, 
you might pick an absolute lemon. <laughs> it just happens to be an intriguing lecture and it's got a bit of flair for acting because, you know, a teacher's also got to be a bit of an actor. Uh, so by doing your research, I mean particularly look into the question of whether that person has him or herself got some achievements in research because they mightn't be very charismatic. Of course. But they might uh, have that kind of depth and reality of expertise that you're looking for. I'm often amazed at how little effort people put into the choice of their mentor, how that's an almost accidental thing as they breeze through their course. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. Um, is there any specific tips or things that, you know, you mentioned that you should look into their research or their achievements? Are there any specifics that you have, you that people should look for? Well, a specific that I would look for, uh, again, this is not so obvious. I wouldn't look so much for numbers of publications. I'd look for the quality of the journals in which the person publishes. You know, it's pretty easy to get a paper published. It's actually quite funny. In my computer, nearly every day, there's a letter from some obscure journal that you've never <laughs> heard of soliciting papers. Uh, Dr. Nossel, we kindly ask you to submit your latest work to a such and such journal of rubbishy irrelevance, <laughs> you know. Whereas everybody knows uh, that, you know, for the short articles, it's nature in the UK or science in the US. For the more deliberative articles, it might be the Journal of Experimental Medicine or Cell. It's not likely to be the Pakistani Journal of Wilderness Science, mm -hmm. you know. And that's, uh, that's a quite important trick. A second thing that you can do, and this is just a bit more sophisticated now, don't just look for the number of publications. Look for the number of citations. Mm -hmm. How often has that scientist published something that another scientist will want to quote in her paper, yeah. you know? And by the way, that's now much easier to be done than it used to be in my day. You can actually find out how often a particular article has been cited, and that's a slightly more sophisticated way. Yeah, that sounds like really interesting advice. Um, I want to just switch gears to, we're talking about the past and I guess the present. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit about the future of the field that you're in. Um, so you oversee cutting edge research and immunology and clinical science. What do you think the future holds for individuals working in these fields or for the field? Well, I think the first thing to say is it is just a marvelous time to be younger in medical science. There are so many openings and that is because the technologies that we have today are so powerful and we have learned so much in the past as a platform on which to gaze into the future. Mm -hmm. I think the future in medical science is going to be quite, quite remarkable. Now, if we want to talk specifics, uh, there would be three things that I would mention. I would mention instrumentation, such as uh, the synchrotron out of mm -hmm. Monash University, just one example of a really sophisticated instrument that allows you to do so many things. The second thing I would mention is gene sequencing, trying yeah. to figure out the details of the DNA of particular cells, of particular individuals, giving you a, a, a depth uh, uh, of insight. And the third thing that I would mention is bioinformatics, so that you can now uh, extract wisdom and depth and interest from masses of data that at the first don't appear to be particularly interesting. But if you have enough of the data, cross interrogate it smartly enough, you'll learn very interesting new things. Yeah, that, they all sound like amazing opportunities. Um, what do you think of impact of technologies like artificial intelligence um, in expanding these fields? Well, I don't know a great deal about artificial intelligence, but I will tell you one thing. The last Nobel Prize in medicine was very smartly awarded. The last Nobel Prize in medicine went to 
two guys, Tony Allison, a Yank, and uh, Tosco Honto, a Japanese, uh, they discovered something which, when you think about it, is actually incredibly simple. They discovered that you can activate something by inhibiting the inhibitor. Now, let me say that a little bit more simply. Uh, it was actually Claude Bernard in the 19th century who discovered to every action is an equal and opposite mm -hmm. reaction. Think of the immune response. The immune response depends on dividing cells. Now, if those cells keep dividing, 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 they'll take over your whole body <laughs> and you'll become a mass of white blood cells yeah, and absolutely. nothing else. So there's got to be something that holds those back. And that's what we call t rex or to put it into simple form, suppressor cells. So the suppressor cells are always there to put a limit on the degree to which an immune response rolls forward. And it just turns out that in the cancer cell field, your own lymphocytes are trying to beat that cancer. But there are, and, and they do, it's been shown quite conclusively through immunodeficient people who get a much higher incidence of cancer, that the immune system does prevent cancers from developing. But there are some where it fails. And in those situations, if you destroy or inhibit those suppressor cells, you unleash the body's own cells to fight the cancer better. And that was first shown for melanoma. It's now also true for lung cancer, for breast cancer. Goodness knows where that field will go. So I think that is a tremendous field to follow. Yeah, that, I mean, that sounds like something that people can, can definitely get involved with. Is that something you think that is, you know, young researchers coming into the field with the idea of, you said before, you have to aim big, Dream yes. big, try yes. and solve these. Try and extend that uh, concept in as many directions as you can. It's going to be a load that will be mined for a long time. That, that sounds amazing. Well, I wanted to thank you very much for your time. Um, I think you've really helped um, give insight and advice for students and people who are starting their careers and interested in research and science. Hopefully, um, I'm sure you will continue to inspire people to pursue uh, careers in research and in science. Um, so thank you so much for your And time. to the young people, I would say, you know, continue with your dream. I'll tell you this, most people in research don't make much money, but boy, do they have an exciting life. <laughs> they have a wonderful life, pitting yourself against the unknown, breasting these particular challenges. Young people, Give it a go, go for it, you'll enjoy it.